Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, and thanks to E3 uh, for organizing such an event uh, on the very interesting uh, topic that we are about to discuss today. Um, although we may speak mostly uh, French uh, during this session, I'll start in English uh, as a sign, let's say, of good faith uh, toward uh, our international uh, audience. Uh, I'm Benjamin Pajot, in, I'm in charge of uh, digital issues at the Policy Planning Center of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, first, uh, I owe you a disclaimer, uh, I'm far from being an expert uh, of quantum, uh, be it in physics or uh, in computing, but that being said, I'll try to make uh, the most, of, uh, the most of, uh, of the four distinguished speakers um, we have around the table today and whom I have the pleasure of welcoming. So our co-host, uh, Alice Panier, is a researcher at E3, uh, where she's in charge of uh, the program on geopolitics of technologies. Uh, she's been working lately on the impact, of, uh, on the impact for Europe uh, of cloud computing, high performance computing, and also quantum computing. Uh, that makes uh, indeed a lot of computing. Uh, Marc Julien is also a member of E3. Uh, he's the head of China research uh, within the Center for uh, Asian Studies, where he mainly uh, focuses on uh, China's foreign uh, security and defense policy. Uh, his most recent uh, research topics uh, include China's space program and uh, China's achievements uh, in quantum physics. We also have uh, Christophe Jorzak, uh, who is the co-founder and managing uh, partner at Quantonation. Uh, the first uh, venture capital fund uh, dedicated to quantum technologies, and uh, he's also uh, the co-founder uh, of the Le Lab Quantique, uh, which is a non-profit think tank uh, in support of the global quantum ecosystem. Um, and he also has extensive uh, experience uh, in the field of uh, renewable uh, energy. And last but not least, uh, Julian uh, von Felsen, uh, who is uh, the CTIO uh, and head of uh, Capgemini's Quantum Lab, uh, which focuses on uh, all three areas of uh, quantum technology, uh, sensing, compute, and communications. Uh, and as he likes to describe uh, himself, he, is, uh, uh, he has an academic background uh, in uh, physics, which is now successfully uh, turning into uh, business opportunities. Um, so, not being an expert, uh, I shall be very brief, uh, so I'll just make uh, three quick comments in order to draw uh, the general landscape and to set the scene. Um, my first comment uh, will be about the numerous uh, promises of quantum computing, which is uh, seen as the next revolution uh, in computing. Um, these are technologies with uh, tremendous capabilities, uh, be it in communications, uh, AI, complex simulations, or also uh, regarding the uh, future uh, environmental impact uh, of computing. So I'll let uh, Alice probably tell us more about uh, these capabilities. And uh, also um, on these uh, tremendous uh, capabilities, everyone has in mind uh, that there are uh, strong implications in terms of security and especially cybersecurity, as Julian uh, will uh, explain to us. And uh, lastly, uh, potentially a wide range uh, of both uh, civil and military uh, applications from satellites to uh, drones and to uh, radar. Um, so my second point uh, will be on the fact that we are far uh, from the deployment of these technologies. Uh, we are uh, indeed at the dawn of uh, what we could say uh, to be a, a new era. Uh, quantum computing is far from being mature which also uh, explains uh, why is it so difficult uh, to grasp it. Um, there is no quantum computer uh, that will uh, rule the world yet, and uh, we are uh, all testing a bunch of different techniques, uh, more or less promising. Uh, which means also uh, that there is still room uh, for uh, European actors uh, to be part of it and to be part of the race to come, uh, and to be, uh, of course, in, in, in a good position. Um, that leads us uh, to my third and last comment. Uh, the race has begun, however, uh, and China and the US uh, are ahead in terms of both uh, financing and uh, ambitions and are regularly uh, announcing breakthroughs. Um, I'll just give you uh, quickly a few recent uh, examples. Um, we got IBM, the American company, uh, which just announced um, 
that it has succeeded in creating a, a pure quantum processor. We also got the Pentagon, uh, which announced recently progress uh, in quantum navigation. And last but not least, um, we uh, have researchers uh, from uh, the University of Science and Technology of China um, that have just claimed to have achieved a, a milestone uh, with their last computer uh, mm -hmm. and taken a, a decisive step towards what we call uh, the quantum advantage, uh, which is a notion that I will leave uh, uh, for our panel to uh, discuss. Uh, of course, Europe uh, has a strong case uh, to make, and within it, France uh, should be one of the leading players, as Alice and Christophe uh, will show us. But this will require uh, adequate tools and massive investment, and also uh, concerted uh, action in order to make the difference. This is why the recently uh, strengthened cooperation between France and the Netherlands um, on this issue is to be welcomed. Uh, but again, uh, the others are not waiting for us, and uh, as shown by uh, the joint agreement on quantum that the US and the UK uh, have just signed. So with this brief introduction, I hope uh, we can see how this topic, uh, although complex, uh, is of major interest uh, for both France and Europe, uh, and I therefore hope that our speakers uh, will help us to untangle uh, these issues and to see more clearly in the midst uh, of these innovations and strategic developments. So I suggest that we follow uh, the order of ap appearance uh, uh, on the program. So we'll start with Julian, and then Mark, uh, Alice, uh, and last but not least, Christophe. Each one of you will have about 10 minutes uh, to share uh, some perspectives with us uh, on this broad issue, and then uh, we should have around uh, 45 minutes of uh, discussion, hopefully. Uh, for the audience uh, watching us, please feel free uh, to ask your questions in the meantime uh, in the dedicated area. Uh, and I'll try to relay them to uh, the Vans. Uh, so Julian, if you would like to start and tell us about your vision of uh, quantum implications for cybersecurity, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And yeah, hopefully you can hear me now. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Julian. Uh, indeed, I work for Capgemini, uh, one of the leading uh, system integrators uh, dealing with all kinds of things related to uh, digital transformation. Uh, but we're also uh, very interested in, uh, in quantum technologies and, and quantum security. Usually, we don't really invest uh, ahead of time. I think what's very important, what, uh, what Benjamin mentioned, is that this is in full development, right? Quantum technologies is, is uh, still many years out there. Um, it's something that, uh, that everyone is very aware of, of the potential, uh, of the risk of, of hype. Uh, we're still uh, uh, not sure if quantum technology or quantum computing will work, if it will be five years or 10 years or ever. Um, but I'm, what I'm uh, here to say today is that there is, there is a lot of difference within quantum technologies. If there's one message uh, uh, that I would like to, to, to give is that there are many opportunities and threats. Uh, some of them are, are uh, much nearer than others are. And I really think it's it's good to at least be uh, be aware of, of some of those uh, some of those challenges and, and opportunities, uh, and that's also the reason why Capgemini is investing uh, ahead of time, uh, really to be ahead of the curve. Uh, I'm um, uh, so CTIO and head of the Capgemini Quantum Lab. Uh, so we very carefully uh, know that this is a lab. Uh, this is a place where we do experiments, uh, where we uh, work together with our clients to, uh, to to try out new type of technologies, to see what it means, to see uh, how we can help uh, our clients with it. And it's definitely not something that is mature and that you can implement uh, today. Um, so one of the uh, things that quantum computers uh, are extremely good at, um, uh, you know, it's it's for, for many of uh, many industries uh, thinking about, you know, what if a quantum computer could uh, uh, replace a wind tunnel. Um, uh, by doing in, in quantum uh, simulations and therefore, uh, you know, reducing the dependency on wind tunnels. Uh, what if uh, quantum computers could um, increase the success rate, success rate of, uh, of phase three trials in life sciences? The, the, the business case would be uh, very clear. Uh, another thing that quantum computers are extremely good at is to, uh, uh, to find uh, a sequence in, uh, in, in numbers. Uh, which happens to be the, the foundation of um, uh, current day cryptography. Uh, so uh, cryptography, that's really a, a cornerstone of, of everything that we uh, do in our digital societies. Um, a large part of it will be seriously threatened or, or broken. Um, 
And the problem is, is not just that it's, it's such a, uh, a, a problem that's everywhere, it's, 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 uh, um, uh, and that will be broken everywhere. The problem is, is very wide. It's that we don't have a good visibility. Um, uh, we don't have awareness of, of, the, of the problem. Uh, cryptography can be uh, you know, not just a plug and play solution where we, we, we would need um, uh, to change the cryptography and that's it. We need to know uh, if it's on the edge, on the cloud, at servers, um, uh, if it's upgradable, what the dependencies are, if there's third parties, if there's uh, laws or regulations. So it's a, it's a whole kinds of questions that we need uh, to answer before uh, being able to, uh, to adapt. So it's a huge uh, risk uh, for, for many of our clients. Um, there are some, uh, some solutions uh, that we are working on and that, that the market is working on to prevent this, well, basically massive security breach. Um, the first thing is, is more related to new types of mathematics that will help us to, to build new encryption that are uh, resilient against those, so those quantum attacks uh, called post-quantum cryptography. Um, and it's, it, is, uh, it is rule development. Um, um, and I think that, that all, of, all of our clients are, are doing good to, to start exploring how they can implement it and start building a strategy. There's also uh, uh, other types of cryptography that leverages quantum, uh, quantum technology itself, uh, called quantum key distribution, uh, which is uh, uh, much more of an academic exercise at this point. Um, it will have large implications on how we develop such a network for, uh, for this new type of cryptography. We'll need to, to think about how we do this in, in space industry. Um, uh, one of the, the key challenges is to figure out how to, to communicate using QKD between satellites, how to communicate with ground stations, how to build uh, networks that are larger than just uh, one city. Um, and, and, and we are just really at the beginning. Uh, so we need to work now to, to have an idea uh, how, how we can work together, how we can build such an ecosystem with all these different players to be able to use uh, these systems. And I think this is just uh, um, you know, some of the first steps. We will see a, 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 a system where it's much, uh, there is such a, a highly dynamic uh, environment where we move to post-quantum crypto first and then to newer types of quantum uh, encryption, and this will not be the end. It will be a continuously update from different types of cryptography to, to newer versions, to better versions, to larger networks, uh, eventually to new type of applications that leverages these, these types of quantum uh, uh, communication. And the, 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 the very dynamic nature of all these, these changes will require us to really rethink the way we do uh, security, the, 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 the ecosystem that we have, the way we set up these things. I think one critical uh, part of it is, uh, is to make sure that we become more agile, uh, both in terms of, of technology, um, being able to replace and to manage and to, to, to catalog our cryptography much better and to be able to switch between newer types of, of technology, as well as from a business perspective, to, to know, you know who do we work with, uh, where do we rely on, what the, um, uh, yeah, wh where the risks are. Um, yeah, so uh, I think this is, in, in short, I what I think the perspective and the, the, the challenges are for, for quantum uh, and the, the, the risk of the instability that quantum technology may bring um, to, uh, to the market. I think there's also a lot of opportunities. Um, uh, in the end, uh, the, the quantum key distribution and the, the newer types of quantum encryption may allow us to, to build new encryption that is theoretically secure, so that will be secure over a long time. Uh, as well as new type of applications that are really impossible. So it's, I think it's really exciting to see um, how we are at the, at the advent of a new type of quantum internet uh, where there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, similar to the classical internet, we have all types of applications that are uh, not possible uh, before, as well as new type of, of possibilities to use quantum computing for, uh, uh, for detecting and, and, and managing uh, cybersecurity risks. Um, so, uh, thank you for that. I'm very happy to be in the school, and uh, I'll give the word back. Thank you very much, uh, Julian, for these uh, very concrete uh, elements uh, that allow us uh, to better uh, understand and grasp uh, the disruptive potential uh, of uh, those technologies. Um, I'll now turn to Mark and switch uh, to French. Um, Mark, vous qui avez travaillé uh, beaucoup. Mark. You've worked a lot on uh, on China, and uh, you have a very good understanding of current uh, 
developments in that country. What can you tell us about uh, the Chinese agenda in terms of quantum technologies? Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Benjamin. Thank you very much to Laurence and Alice for the invitation. So as you've just said, I'm a specialist of China, of uh, a specialist in Chinese politics. I'm not a quantum specialist, but uh, it was absolutely fascinating to delve into this topic, which is really a gripping topic. So I don't have a lot of time, so I'd like to talk about uh, the political aspects, ambitions, the doctrine in China related to high tech and quantum science. And then I'll, I'll deal with a number of topics and uh, areas of quantum innovation, which look quite promising and on which uh, the Chinese are banking a lot. So in the Chinese political context, uh, I think it's important first to uh, point out that the Chinese Communist Party is very much uh, technology oriented. It believes that it's with technology that uh, China will find salvation, that it will develop itself. And it is clearly stated that science and technology are the uh, leading driving forces of national development in China. So technology is important, and this includes AI, space, and quantum technologies. These are priorities for the Communist Party. So it's a priority for national development, and the Chinese President Xi Jinping recently uh, pointed this out during a conference in September 2021. He talked about the contradiction in society between, on the one hand, the aspiration for better life prospects, and the other hand, uh, an, uneven, an uneven imbalanced economic development across uh, Chinese social categories. So let me quote him. To uh, meet this aspiration for better life, further scientific and technological innovation aiming at the people's welfare ha will have to be achieved. End of quote. But there's also the strategic and uh, also military aspect of these technologies. Uh, and uh, today's competition between China and science, science and technology are a priority. China will not catch up with uh, China in terms of, uh, well, quantitatively and qualitatively. It will actually uh, do this by taking huge leaps forward. And quantum is one way of doing that. The context uh, of uh, the quantum scientific ecosystem in China is also something I I'd like to address. It's quite interesting. Since the 1980s and 1990s, there has been some academic research on quantum physics without, e without re any real breakthrough. It's really starting from 2008 that it uh, got off the ground, particularly with the return to China of a man named Pan Tianwei, who is uh, known or dubbed as the father of quantum physics in China. He returned to China in 2008, back from Europe. He went to Europe in the 1990s, where he did his PhD at uh, the Vienna University in uh, in Austria with a major uh, a scientist, Anton Zeilinger. And that's where he started uh, to work uh, on, on these topics. He then went to Germany after his PhD, mainly uh, at the Heidelberg University as part uh, of a Marie Curie EU Excellence Grant to work on quantum optics. So he came back to China in 2008 and uh, joined the USTC, the University of Science and Technology of China. Uh, which is based in Hefei, not very far from Nanjing. And that's really when he started, founded a laboratory and that uh, the, the numerous uh, quantum research programs started to develop. So it's really the USTC, this university, which is the very heart of quantum research in China. And this is really the university that centralizes uh, jointly with the other universities and the military many programs uh, in many quantum research areas. But I'd like to focus more specifically on two of these, computer science that we've already mentioned and quantum, so quantum uh, uh, computer science and quantum uh, telecommunications. So um, as regards quantum computers, Julian has already mentioned that. So I'm not going to talk about all the potential. It's already been covered. But we're talking about uh, com computing c capabilities that uh, make it possible to, to uh, carry out simulations. There can be knock-on effects in the industry, in medicine, in, in the fight against climate change, in the production of batteries, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is absolutely flabbergasting. Uh, this is really a world of unfathomable uh, promises. 
We'll see whether these promises come true. Anyway, in terms of computers, in December 2020, uh, Professor Pan Chenwei's team, as, as I've already mentioned this gentleman, they announced uh, that uh, they had reached the quantum advantage with a photonic processor, which uh, uh, is based on photon entanglement, so uh, light particles, photons. And they announced that they had reached this quantum advantage, meaning that uh, this processor can uh, do a, a calculation that would have taken, according to some estimates, up to, to two or several billions of years. So let me repeat, a processor that in, in a few minutes solved an operation that would have required billions of years with a standard computer, a standard supercomputer. So that's a photonic processor. Later on in July 2021, China went through uh, another step, another stage, uh, with this time the quantum advantage with a, a superconducted a superconductor process. It's a different type of technology which uh, is based on superposing the energy level of particles. So it's a processor that uh, operates at very, very low temperatures that are close to absolute zero. So this breakthrough was in July 2021, one and a half years after Google announced in December 2019, I suppose you heard about that in the press, uh, that Google announced quantum supremacy with its uh, Sycamore 53 qubits Sycamore, a uh, Sycamore processor. So uh, 18 months later, uh, the Chinese uh, went even further with a 66 qubits processor. So you can see that we have two concepts that are completely different, so superconductors and uh, photonics. Well, with two very different concepts, the Chinese have managed to demonstrate with their own concept something that uh, worked. Now, telecommunications. China is probably one of the or the most advanced countries in terms of telecommunications. So there's quantum telecommunications on one on the one hand and uh, and and cryptography on the other hand. You correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so. We have cryptography related to, to quantum computers uh, for things that Sir Juno has already mentioned. The fact that, for example, a computer can easily break uh, cryptography, the, the cryptography protocols that we have today. Quantum telecommunications is about using the, the, the principles of quantum physics to create encryption keys. So using QKD, uh, so quantum key distribution. And again, this has already been mentioned by Julian. So the objective of this is uh, to ensure uh, unconditional securing of communications. That is no, that means that no future technology, even uh, quantum computers, uh, should be able to break these codes, theoretically, of course. So China works a lot on this. Uh, uh, there are quite uh, staggering achievements, at, at least larger scale achievements, such as, for example, the uh, inter-urban secure quantum communication line between Beijing and Shanghai. So let's just call it the Beijing-Shanghai communication line. Uh, construction started in 2013. It was inaugurated in 2017. It's 2,000 kilometers long. And today, uh, it has been declared by Chinese authorities as operational, as up and running, and it is used for communication between governmental institutions, uh, services of the military, and banking services. Now, we need to specify right at this stage that even though Chinese authorities say it's operational, it's not fully inviolable. It's not fully a quantum communication line from the beginning to the end, because like uh, in other parts of the world, uh, the Chinese... Uh, have difficulties uh, maintaining the signal because this is based on uh, photons that travel through optic fiber. Uh, so there's a loss in the light signal as uh, as the signal travels. So you need to regenerate this uh, calculation uh, regularly, and that's one of the f that's one weakness in this system. Another staggering achievement after the Shanghai uh, Beijing communication line is the Mortar a quantum satellite, or uh, also the QUESS program, the KESS satellite program. The idea was to remedy what I've, the problem that I've just mentioned, the loss of a light signal in optical, uh, uh, in fiber optics. Now, uh, there's uh, much less loss uh, through air, and even it's even better in space. So it's easier to send a message uh, through air and uh, through uh, space uh, than through optical fibers. In 2016, the Chinese launched a satellite to carry out to 
quantum communication operations, experiments, uh, so to send messages between their satellites and ground bases. Originally, this satellite was an idea of Anton Seiliger, uh, the, uh, the PhD director of uh, the, the Mr. Apantian Wei, who had had this idea to develop co telecommunications. And at the time, they agreed that uh, they would uh, each go to their domestic space agencies to find and s to secure funds uh, for the development of these programs. Anton Seiliger went to the uh, ESA, which did not think that uh, this principle was uh, interesting or relevant for the reason that I've mentioned. That is, what can be experimented between uh, the ground and satellite is the, is what uh, uh, researchers have been doing for 40 years in laboratories, and it's much cheaper, and it's uh, much easier to do this in laboratory than uh, in LEO. So they, honestly, there was, well, they thought there were no uh, relevant uh, scientific progress. Ban Tianwei went to the Chinese Space Agency, which thought this project was interesting, and it, it uh, uh, provided funding. So originally, uh, so this pro this uh, project was launched. Uh, it originally had a life expectancy of two years, and it is it is still up and running. So they've carried out carried out a number of experiments uh, using QKDs uh, uh, between uh, space and ground, ground and space, and space and various ground stations. So it's uh, the distribution of encryption keys, so that uh, two uh, ground-based entities can exchange a message using uh, a, a traditional network, but uh, with uh, this encryption key, this quantum encryption key. So the fact is that uh, today, uh, well, I, I don't know whether in Europe there's still some uh, uh, interest for these experiment experiments and uh, scientific uh, programs, but uh, there is interest for this in China, especially after this program that was launched in 2016. Uh, Chinese authorities and, and scientists seem to see an interest in this because Chinese scientists have already declared that they had the ambition to launch a small constellation of quantum satellites in the region of three or five satellites with a higher orbit to have a higher or wider coverage and some sort of redundancy, uh, uh, the, the a duplicate of uh, the Earth coverage. So uh, in the long term, the objective, and, and Julian mentioned uh, this as well, is quantum internet. And that would be an architecture that would be a space-based architecture with a constellation of satellites, uh, ground stations that would receive the signal uh, on the Earth and a network across the Chinese territory to start with. And it's uh, the prototype of the uh, Shanghai-Beijing uh, uh, line, which is really being replicated across the country. So this quantum internet, its ambition, and, and, and again, uh, th these are the promises of quantum telecommunications, but for China, this would be a considerable edge, uh, advantage uh, over the rest of the world if this principle were to uh, be successful, and if China were to secure it. It would be an advantage for its own communications, for example, communication in its uh, network of embassies, for its military, but also for its business, businesses, uh, but also for commercial applications. For example, there could be commercial applications in uh, online banking, finance, intercompany communication, and also intra-company communication. So this could provide Chinese companies uh, a clear advantage, uh, but also uh, foreign companies. But the, the, there are issues of dependency here. These companies would... Uh, be dependent uh, on uh, the authority that would control these systems, these systems, and in China that would be public agencies. Right, I'll stop here. I just wanted to say that uh, Chinese innovation in quantum physics is clearly based on a method. It's methodical. Uh, it's clearly determined. Programs are clear, supported. There are substantial funding, and political support is also quite obvious. Of course, there are still a, a lot of hurdles to be cleared, especially uh, technical and technological, but uh, China is clearly a rising power and uh, a very serious competitor in uh, the international quantum science competition. Thank you very much. Thank you, pour, uh... Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for, the, for this exhaustive presentation of all areas in which China is active. And uh, it clearly shows that uh, it's a central issue for the Communist Party. And, and thank you also for putting all this back into perspective uh, by going back in history and showing that maybe this had some European origins. Uh, uh, 
uh, the, the evolutions, uh, the developments we are witnessing in China may have had uh, European origins. And that's a fitting transition to Alice, uh, who is going to uh, present uh, the European state of play uh, in, in French. And she's going also to put things back into perspective just after Mark's presentation. Alice, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Benjamin. Thank you uh, to all of you for being here. So it's great to be uh, an organizer, but also panelist in the conference. Uh, uh, well, it's not always very comfortable, but anyway, thank you very much for attending this event. Uh, and, and also thank you very much to people who are uh, directly involved in uh, European and French quantum science. So we are really honored to welcome you here. And we do hope that uh, specialists of uh, quantum physics uh, can shed some light on questions that uh, may be asked uh, from the floor, from uh, our uh, attendees and uh, from our participants online. So first of all, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, challenges uh, related to quantum computers, which, as you've gathered, uh, are part of a, of a whole set of uh, uh, quantum technologies. So it's only one part. And we have... Uh, uh, we, 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 are, we are observing a sort of... Uh, uh, race uh, that uh, has been starting uh, in the last two to three years and uh, Europe uh, is in a specific position that I'm going to try and define but it's not very clear so it is clearly something that's in flux which is highly dynamic which uh, has risks and opportunities uh, as well uh, unlike uh, some uh, areas which are already well established in digital technologies so there has been an acceleration in the last years but I think we need to remember that uh, the, the infancy of quantum uh, uh, computers uh, was uh, in the 1990s, uh, where the principles of these computers were developed. And since 2016, more or less, there has been a phase of implementation of these uses, even though we are still at the experimental stage. I'll come back to that in a minute. So the objective of quantum computers uh, is to ensure uh, an exponential acceleration of computation power to uh, uh, do things that cannot be done uh, in, a, in, a, in a time limit which is humanly uh, acceptable because uh, we, we are talking here about uh, millions, billions of years of computing for, for some uh, of these operations. So to do that, various uh, particles uh, are uh, used, so uh, also lasers, magnetic fields, electric fields, and so on and so forth. And so it's, it's all very, very difficult to carry out. And that's why today uh, there are technologies which are at the experimental stage. And there are several technological avenues which are being explored, as Mark said, uh, talking about uh, recent Chinese uh, examples. Another point I'd like to make about uh, current uh, technologies in development, quantum computers, because uh, of their structure and their setup, uh, use other, let's call them enabling technologies, for example, cryogenics, because some quantum processes uh, need to be cooled down uh, to uh, below the, uh, the, the usual temperature. So this requires other technologies around the processor, including cryostats. So let me give you a sort of time horizon. I don't think we've talked it yet, and even though there's a debate on that, we, well, the time horizon uh, for an up-and-running quantum computer is uh, in 10 years from now, five years, according to some estimates. Because uh, there's still uh, quite a number of technical challenges, and uh, the error rate is still very high. However, this is a, a very open field uh, with many opportunities, some of which have already been mentioned. There's uh, what, what some call quantum supremacy, so uh, doing uh, seemingly impossible calculations, but also, as you said, Mark, uh, the quantum advantage. And it's rather about uh, accelerating computing to, well, that, that, that's, uh, so the acceleration of computing that is enough to uh, do calculation, uh, not necessarily calculation that would require uh, millions of years for a, a standard supercomputer, but it's just something that would uh, make the difference. For example, uh, in cybersecurity or for other uses that, that may be uh, more related to everyday life. As I've said, uh, it is assessed that there are significant economic opportunities with quantum computers. So let me give you a few examples on the uh, quantum advantage uh, and its uh, uh, everyday 
uses uh, in the industry and in various fields, it is assessed that the acceleration that could be given by quantum computers, for example, uh, with uh, AI and neural networks, so with all this you can uh, go faster, you could go faster with the deployment of these networks uh, compared with a traditional computer, but also there are three other advantage, advantages, factoring, uh, optimization, for example, so uh, areas where quantum computers have a significant uh, advantage. Uh, as Julian said, uh, factoring is uh, very useful to uh, decipher and break uh, encryption keys. So that's that's a real uh, challenge in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, complex simulation now, uh, for example, it's used in medicine where you can simulate useful uh, molecules, uh, molecules that are useful for the development of drugs, and also for task optimization, an example which is often given, if, even though it's not the one that's uh, within our reach today, it's the coordination uh, of a large number of self-driving vehicles, uh, uh, the, the paths or the trajectory of which can be optimized on a large scale. So many economic opportunities if uh, quantum computers uh, uh, work one day, which might be possible within 10 years from now. Of course, uh, there are also uh, cyber, secur cyber security risks, as mentioned by Julian. Now, there are other risks in the geopolitical context. Uh, uh, I'll uh, um, discuss that. I'll talk about the progress made by various powers, including uh, Europeans. So access to technologies, quantum technologies themselves, whether uh, quantum cryptography or quantum telecommunications or quantum computers themselves, all these technologies uh, are now uh, subject to export restrictions or are being debated and uh, may end up on the list of sensitive technologies uh, that may also be uh, subject to export and access restrictions. But there are also enabling technologies uh, like cryostats that I mentioned, which are necessary to cool down some processors. These technologies uh, are also being added uh, to those lists or are uh, now being uh, uh, put under control. Well, there's a debate uh, There's a debate about this in the United States, especially uh, in relation to the competition with China. Now, as regards this international competition, what are the strategies uh, implemented and where does Europe stand in this context that I've briefly described? The United States. Let me just come back to what Mark said. It's interesting to see that uh, in this area, China was a pioneer, at least for some dimensions of quantum technologies, especially uh, satellites and, and cryptography. As for the United States, uh, well, mainly thanks to uh, the Silicon Valley, it has uh, dominated uh, quantum uh, uh, computers mainly. Uh, now, if you look at uh, the US government, uh, in 2018, uh, a strategy was developed by Donald Trump, the National Quantum Inici Initiative, $1.2 billion for five years between 2018 and 23 and also the creation of a National Coordination Office on Quantum Technologies in the White House, which, see, which, seems that, which shows that it's very high on the agenda. It is of strategic value. I think it was created in 2020, in August. So I've just mentioned this 1.2 billion initiative, the National Quantum Initiative. But there's also a bill, the United States Innovation Competition Act, the UCCAR, which is currently being debated in Parliament and potentially $150 billion could be invested in the next five years into critical and emerging technologies. And part of this money would be devoted to quantum technologies. So that would be quite huge amounts. Also, there are the investments of large, com of, or the investments of companies, of large companies that are not uh, known, but that uh, we're probably looking at millions, billions of dollars. For example, IBM, Google, Intel that are well advanced, for example, IBM, which has already exported a first uh, uh, commercial, commercially available quantum computer, even though it's uh, experimental. One of its computers uh, has been exported to Germany and uh, was installed uh, in June this year. And IBM is also planning to have a stable 100 qubit computer, quantum computer, between now and 2023, which... Uh, would be a quite an advantage uh, in terms of cybersecurity if you if you manage to have a 100 qubit computer. China's already been mentioned. I, I 
will not labor the point. As regards Europe, the ecosystem is growing with uh, several states or several laboratories. It, it's not uh, always relevant uh, to think in terms of countries. Still, we'll come back to that because sometimes it does matter. So ecosystems have been developed in the, in the UK, in Germany, France, the, the Netherlands, uh, Austria and Switzerland. The British were the first to develop a national quantum technology strategy, which was unveiled in 2013. Since then, it has remained a priority. There's the integrated review, which is the British foreign policy document that was issued in 2021. There's a lot of emphasis on uh, technologies, including quantum. And the head of uh, GCHQ, so the, uh, the, so the, 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 the British intelligence signals intelligence uh, service that aims at uh, being independent uh, in quantum. But at the same time, there's a very strong transit. So there are a lot of startups, but there are also a lot of transatlantic uh, projects, like, for example, Rigetti, which is based in California and uh, which uh, is expected to deliver the first up and running quantum computer uh, in the UK for uh, uh, the, the, the British government and British research institutes. And also, as you said at the start, uh, there was a, a common uh, US-British declaration at uh, the start of November for greater cooperation in quantum. And I'll come back to that about uh, the uh, consequences for the EU. In Germany now, a, a 2 billion euro investment plan was announced in June 2020, uh, a plan that will run until 2025, which is quite close to the French uh, uh, plan which was announced of 1.1 billion euros uh, on either side in France and Germany quantum is regarded as a technology that can play in part uh, in uh, European sovereignty uh, especially in a context of a major international competition particularly geopolitically however the German choice to implement this strategy was to acquire an IBM uh, computer as I've said to start experimenting and developing uh, quantum skills and there are plans to install other computers, including the computer of a non-American company, a hybrid uh, Pascal Atos computer, if I'm correct, which could be installed in Jülich, in the Jülich uh, Research Center. So uh, this choice hasn't been made in France, but again, the strategy, the strategy coordinator will correct me if I'm wrong. So no choice has been made to acquire pre-existing, uh, so the IBM pre-existing system, but rather the choice was made to support the French ecosystem to have uh, our own uh, technologies and have uh, a good control of uh, uh, the uh, of a good share of uh, the quantum uh, chain, whether hardware or software, uh, but also enabling technologies. In France, uh, like in many other European countries, there's a problem. It's the size of the ecosystem because even though it's very, it's vibrant, it's a vibrant ecosystem, we do have startups uh, that are uh, well advanced. Uh, we have Pascal, Alice and Bob as well, which, uh, as we've mentioned, uh, uh, is uh, seeking to develop a quantum processor that will avoid errors. Well, that's a technical aspect, but... Uh, as I've said, uh, that's that's a major issue uh, in the development of quantum computers, the error rate. So this company is trying to develop an error-free process. And uh, this uh, the, the, their, pub their publications have uh, influenced what Amazon is trying to develop uh, on its own. So we do see that uh, there are some significant developments, but there's a difficulty. But I'll let Christophe uh, address that. Uh, it's th the growth of companies in Europe. Uh, there's a lack of investment, and there are substantial costs for the development of these uh, highly complex technologies, uh, quantum, quantum computers. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll finish uh, very briefly with uh, the EU. Uh, Brussels uh, is also developing uh, its uh, uh, strategy, or at least uh, in financing uh, uh, in quantum with the quantum flagship project. Uh, there's, uh, well, the equivalent of 1 billion euros over 10 years, was, which as such uh, isn't much, but still, this is the biggest collaborative funding uh, on the global stage. So uh, the biggest international uh, financing of research. But uh, it, it's mainly focused on, on computers and, as Mark said, also the, uh, the Internet of the future. So uh, telecommunication, quantum infrastructures. I, I'll stop here, but I'd like to uh, ask a few questions to, to uh, start the discussion. 
So there are precedents uh, in uh, standard computer science uh, where choices uh, were made of specific uh, uh, technologies, of, uh, for example, American technologies like IBM. So the question today for Europeans is to know uh, what technology will be adopted uh, by states uh, and companies, l research laboratories. Is there somehow, uh, a U should we have a European preference in this very strategic uh, environment, especially as uh, you, uh, when you when you take into consideration uh, cybersecurity risks? And the, the, another question is, who can we cooperate with? And currently in Brussels, uh, there are debates about the opening of, uh, of uh, financing and of, of international research projects to the British, the, the Swiss, to Israel, the United States. So the question is, the question is, when does uh, collaborative uh, research, uh, scientific research, become something strategic that has to be protected? So uh, these are some real political challenges. I'm just asking these questions. So I suppose you can discuss that. Uh, I was a bit longer, but uh, uh, I'm done. I'm going to hand over to Christoph. Merci, Alice. Thank you, Alice, for all this, for outlining all the national prospects which are rolled out today. And I should tell you that part of these elements can be found in interesting notes at your disposal on a table outside in the patio. And the remarks of Mark and Alice on their previous work. Now we have. Christophe behind the table. Christophe is going to lay out a few elements on the shift of emerging ecosystem in quantum. Christophe, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Christophe jean -Zac. I'm part of Quantum Nation Investment Funds dedicated to quantum technology. I have a presentation slideshow. Here we go. Thank you. I have to ask or, okay. I've changed the title. Investment challenge was not relevant. I think there is a real European opportunity for European investors and society to go into quantum investment. I'm gonna give you a snapshot of what Alice has done, especially in our wonderful report. That's very illustrative. Now I'm going to show you quickly a few basic concepts, and we'll go into the details. I believe the first item, which is quite important, I agree with the analysis in the report, startup do not live in um, clouds. They come from uh, ecosystem. We have university research centers coming from the startups, which is typical of quantum is these companies don't come from um, their basement. No, 10, 20 years ago, research centers in most entities have been working. It's slightly different in software, but in most companies, there is a background. It means there is a strong link between universities and companies and the people coming from these universities, there is a high potential in these companies, very strong link, and we want to maintain these links and other players, such as the users of these technologies, they have to be integrated, they have to be used and dialogue with startups, especially as Ali said, and with other speakers, we have not yet reached the commercial stage. For quantum, we have reached the supremacy, the demonstration that for some type of academic computation, we have a benchmark of quantum computers are much bigger and better than traditional computers. We are not there yet where quantum computers are used by companies in their workflow to achieve now commercial operations. We are not there yet, which creates specific complexity in the sector. The question is always too early or too late. We do believe it's the right time to go for it, but we have to ask the question, what deadline, what's going to happen, when it's going to be a potential threat, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. This one, you can't read it. It's much too small in print, but it shows it's tough, complex. But the slide shows that when you talk quantum, there are various different realities. You have apps, applications. There is no 
quantic coordinators, and one topic we have not mentioned are quantum sensors, which can be of fundamental strategic interest for navigation when you don't have a GPS. Some quantum, quantum technologies can help you navigate, especially in the military field and all other technologies such as dilution fridge, but also photon detectors, electronics, a lot of electronics codes, traditional codes, not always quantum algorithm, but also necessary development in terms of compilers, electronic boards in on quantum computers. It's a lot of technologies. Uh, the order of magnitude of the chain of value in quantum, it can be hardware on the software compiler, on app um, systems. It could be a problem when it's complex restriction to export that could be raised for certain technology if a quantum computer manufacturer has some minor components where there are potential export restrictions, it can be a real problem. And the rising debate today on dual technology, on uh, limited export of quantum technologies, that's where professional organization and governments will have to debate these issues during the next few months. Next slide. And uh, indeed, something I want to talk about, organization which is quite important in Europe, it's quick. Quantum Industry Consortium, they have Quantum Industry Development Consortium in the US uh, that gathers sector professional. Quick was um, set up this year at the initiative of the European institutions. They also wanted that the industrial sector be organized. It's a good idea. 100 members had the um, beginning in April, 100, 240 today. People manufacturing quantum computers, laser electronics, sensors, people like Bosch, Thales, and startups such as Alice Bob, Pascal, and a number of issues to be solved, which are going to grow in importance. And it's proof that industry is becoming mature, understanding, aware of the problems, and the market will be created with the US. Quick is being discussed. I mentioned that. We also have a number of French institutions called the Lab Quantique that was set up in back in 2018, gathering various ecosystem players and developing to play a larger role. Next slide. In this environment, I came here to talk about finance and startups. Two things you need to keep in mind. We started in 2018 with an investment fund at the right time, but uh, before anything else, um, mastered in physics, and we have made um, investments on startup across the world. There are two key factors which are produced that did not exist in 2017, 2018, when we first started. Big financial support, government financial subsidies, 20 billion euros roughly by governments that have decided to support quantum technologies at various levels of fundamental research, but applied research infrastructure demonstrators and a lot of countries today have started working. Of course, the EU, uh, but of course, states, uh, UK, France, UK, Germany, and on the right curve, which is very big, private investment venture capital investments in quantum technologies over the last few years and starting in 2017, 2018, we did contribute to that at a small scale, but a lot of investments were made this year, and this figure goes back to July, covers venture capital, but if you have stock this year, there will be three billion private money invested in uh, quantum technology between venture capital and stock exchange. It's an explosion. It goes exponential growth of investments, which shows and proves that a lot of investors believe in the emergence of this technology support to startups. Next slide. Next slide, please, again. Skip one. There's something I wanted to talk about that was not in the 
Ali Spagné report on this. It's a recent report, which is an important factor to take into consideration. Last month in October, we have had the first pure quantum startups pure that was um, on a stock exchange in the US with a blank check company, which has raised $600 million, $600 million cash today to develop this new technology. They are building, manufacturing a quantum computer in Lyon. So the share price went up $30 yesterday, went the stock price went up and very large ambitions as well. So the figures, keep in mind these figures, we're talking about a national plan of one or two billion. We also have a startup which alone can gather 600 million, and if they had to do it again, they would find another 500 or 600 million. We have private actors today which can develop strongly. Today we have to take that, and we have to be aware of that in the global reflection on quantum. Things can go faster than we expected because there is a lot of money going into that. We still have limits, but it shows the way. That's the second company. Rigatti in the U.S. coming to the stock X U.S. It's going to bloom in four to five months. It's a long process, taking time. It's fast, but it's going to take five to 12 months. It's a superconductor quantum computer. I wanted to show you their revenue projection. These companies will become public. They are becoming public on the stock exchange, so we will have more development possibilities, opportunities, because then those venture in venture capital, but their expectations, they project on uh, quantum technology revenues are quite ambitious. So as of 2025, this company to deliver up to $300 million per year to deliver revenues about $300 million um, per year when today it's zero. Of course, there are risks involved, but it's quite significant. Next slide, what's happening in Europe? Several things are happening in Europe. One first aspect, you have heard about the European um, Development Council supporting innovations in Europe, which has benefited over the last few months of quantum technology. There is the ESAF accelerator. It's a system which is quite virtuous because it's a combination of cash and equity, 2.5 million of cash and 15 billion, roughly, of equities, five companies inside the quantities, three French companies, Lisebob and Pascal, and another one, three French companies, quite uh, interesting and original scheme and approach. So it's good for the EU to fund this new technology. Next slide. And another key factor in Europe, and I think we should start thinking about it, Europe to the difference. Yes, well, yeah, contrary to the US, Europe has adopted a new approach, a joint HPC high performance calculation and quantum in Europe in public policies, we combine development of computer and development of quantum with high performance calculators. And in Italy, we have one of the largest computing centers on the cloud model, have access to matching passes through the MatchCup platform. And in Germany, a few days, the IRZ Center in Munich, large computing center, they have purchased two press IQM platform, which is Finnish, but also running in Germany. We have manufacturers in Europe. We mentioned IBM before. Germany buys uh, an IBM processor and supports the national industry. At the same time, another slide, I'm going to go even faster. I would like to say a few words about this, about this slide, and then we'll come to the conclusion because it was far too long, but this one shows something which is a problem because the number of startups and companies in a field of startup every year, a book by Olivier Xetti on quantum technology, it's both in French and English, you can find it on his site. It shows clearly there was a peak in the uh, creation of companies between 2018 2019 because that's where we have started playing, I uh, started investing at, as of that period. We have to current, it's quite important for all players to have 
the emergence of new companies in Europe, it's never too late to create companies in this field. We are uh, seeing this here, it's picking up again, and on this curve, it shows it's important to maintain the creation of companies on all these companies, calculation, computing sensors, and others, etc. And I would like to turn to the next slide. I'm going to give you a few illustrations of ecosystems, so you will be able to go look at them into detail in France. Initiatives to help support companies. IT Founder is a training program in Paris which has helped Alice and Bob several platforms. Cryptonex, they have helped very performant. We train scientists to set up their own companies. Toronto is a Toronto has become the hub of quantum software because of this initial the creative destruction lab. We have 25 new ones in the field of quantum. It's a very performing program in Toronto. They have a quantum valley uh, around Toronto on um, quantum te technologies. Quite interesting. Chicago, they have launched this year an accelerator with a lot of public money, 10 different companies which are in it. Cooperation between the Illinois University, University of Chicago, a local organization called P33, a beautiful program where they use public infrastructure to start new project. Next slide. A very performing ecosystem showing the interest to have shared infrastructure. Keep this in mind in Europe. It's the Sherbrooke ecosystem. They have built a new building. Sherbrooke is two hours away from Montreal East and they have free uh, fridge. Uh, fridge costs around one million if you want to start on a startup concept. Having access to shared infrastructure is quite great when you are a startup. It's an example to follow. Next slide. Eventually, the Paris ecosystem Quantum is based on several in interesting um, quantum bicycle with the national uh, policy on quantum technology, and if we will have uh, soon. We will soon have new news about a hybrid classic quantum center research center at the heart of an ecosystem around Paris and France with European access. We have created quantum courses, which is a co-working for quantum, uh, attracting foreign companies. Spanish TS is British. The appeal for France and other countries, not only the creation of startups, but uh, appealing to them and bringing them in. Next, uh, eventually, this is an example of an ecosystem initiative. I insist on ecosystem. It's by strengthening ecosystem that we will become attractive and create value. It's uh, something that emerged, was born in Paris with an organization called Quantis, Quantix Hackathon, which has attracted new industries on had questions on how to control quantum and adopt quantum. L'Oréal, Saint-Gobain, Moratos, EMI, industries suggesting on working on case studies and how to turn case studies into commercial applications or beautiful initiatives that could be spread next year, could be continued next year. Next, to conclude, Quanto Nation. Quanto Nation, a few words. We are an investment fund leading in the world by size largest quantum technology industry. Not huge amounts, but a lot of work to help companies pop up 17 investments across Europe, but also in North America. Next slide. Those companies on the four quantum technology segments, quantum capitalists, réseau quantique, crypto quantique, Crypto Café Post Quantic and Communication, but also sensing uh, side technology, slightly different, which is almost quantic. Optical calculations quite mature based on innovative physical principles. 17 companies, we should reach 20 companies 
quickly, last uh, slide, I've asked the startup to give me the picture because I wanted to uh, boast about our projects are made in France computer. A computer made in France, a real machine, it's the very first time the picture is shown. We are authorized to show it. It's a computer of the Pascal company based in Massy outside Paris. 200 cubic today, up to 512 cubic in four months. It's not a lab computer anymore. It's not an optical table with mirrors anymore. As you can see, this machine starts to be integrated, which goal is to be in a high performance computing center, starting working on computing on combination optimization, graph classification and quantum classification. I've taken the example of a quantum simulator for physical systems. They have been able to show it with 200 cubics. It's a real supremacy quantum demonstration. It's been done in France and in Europe. We don't always know how to sell it and market it, but today we are able to run quantum supremacy experiences in Europe and other seven uh, IQM we've seen it. Europe is in a good position. And a number of hardware startups which are well positioned on this aspect. To the next slide. I just want to say it's never too late. People ask me often, is it too late to start a startup? It's not too early, but it's never too late to start working on these technology. Keep in mind the deadlines. I think it's going to be long term on 10 years, 15 years, even more applications will pop up quickly. As an investor, it's the right time to start. There's a high potential and will be followed by others that are going to invest 100 thousand million of dollars that we will need for sure. Join the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe, so for this beautiful message of hope. Let's turn quickly to questions. We are running late because your presentations were long and interesting. I can see a lot of questions, questions coming by those watching us on their screen. Do we have immediate questions from the audience inside this room. We might take several questions all together, and you can ask your questions in English. Julian Van, Vel Van Velzen, unless I was distracted, I think I heard you say that QKD is a much more academic exercise in your opinion, that given that we heard claims of operational systems that I'd be interested to know if you think uh, it's further away from maturity, if there's uh, more tougher R&D problems to resolve yet than in other domains. Is there any other question in the room? Is there any other question in the room? Okay, so Julian, if you want to start with this one, and then we'll take questions from the remote uh, audience. Yeah, thank you. So I think quantum, quantum key distribution is relatively uh, more mature than, for example, uh, quantum computing is. Uh, the te technical uh, necessities for, for QQD and, uh, are, are, are more feasible than for computing. Um, there is a lot of challenges with operating uh, a QQD, right? So even though QQD is available, it's for very small uh, time for length scale. So Alice also mentioned it, and uh, that the system decays, uh, the signal decays exponentially over 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 distance. So in practice, um, I see the implementations that there have been so far. For example, in the Netherlands, there's a connection between uh, uh, Leida and Delft. Um, is, is mostly driven from academics and from the interest to, to create a test bed for this, uh, this technology. Um, especially compared to uh, um, uh, post-quantum crypto, which is a completely classical solution, right? It's just a new type of mathematics that is just resilient against these quantum computers. I see that there is, there is a large upcoming business uh, um, uh, need to, to adopt this type of, of cryptography and, and start migration and planning for, for this technology uh, compared to, to QQD, which is really, you know, even though it's, I think it's uh, um, 
there are some commercial products available. The, the main interest is, is more academic. Thank you very much, uh, Union. Um, je ne vois pas, uh, pour la régie, uh, les, les deux premières questions qui ont été posées. Je vois que vous êtes sur la, la bonne slide, mais uh, elles n'apparaissent pas uh, sur, le, sur le retour. Si on pouvait les avoir, puis que, que je puisse les prendre dans l'ordre. À moins que ce soit les mêmes. Non. Ah oui, d'accord. OK. Parfait. Uh, so, uh, a question from uh, Hector Fenech. Ah, OK. OK, OK. Autant pour moi. So, we got uh, two questions from uh, the audience. So this this was this morning, yeah. Okay, uh, a question uh, um, about uh, the military uh, capabilities uh, that will be impacted by uh, the evolution of uh, quantum technologies, be it in cyber communication sensors, and the fact that uh, what what would be the potential uh, in terms of defense and uh, offen uh, offense um, in this uh, in this regard. Uh, this is a question for Alice, but I think that uh, it's also addressed to all the panelists. Yes. Um, so, uh, so, elle est en anglais, en français C'est en français Elle était en français, je suis okay. désolé. <laughs> désolé. Um, je vais répondre en français. Um, alors, I will answer in French, because the question was in French. I did not deal with the military dimension in the my report in my research, but if colleagues have something to add to that, you are kindly invited to pitch in. I did concentrate on the computer aspect of quantum technology if you take into consideration sensors. Of course, we all know sensors allow to detect objects submarine under the sea or in the atmosphere in a more precise way. Uh, that will defy the uh, stealth system, stealth, in an offensive and defensive target. We mentioned security, security for communication systems. That was mentioned for security matters, uh, for offensive means as well. It comes into play if we overlook a potential higher computation power. These technologies can be civilian or military, provided quantum technologies are useful. Artificial intelligence or optimization of trajectories. If you have a bunch of plenty of weapon systems, automatic weapon systems, lethal or not, if you have uh, drones under the s mm, marine or air drones allowing quantum pa technology, it could be allowed as well as for civilian use. I don't know if you have anything to add. Maybe Mark, uh, anything you would like to add? Yes. Let me carry on with what you said because I agree, of course. Quantum communication is important to secure communication inside armed forces. It's highly strategic. We have mentioned sensors. And one of the warm topics are quantum gyroscope. Julien mentioned that fully autonomous gyroscope on board an aircraft, a ship, or a tank allowing to be self-sufficient from geo-positioning satellites. It's important to debate with this morning on space vulnerability. In China, there is a hot topic, repeat it, that of quantum radars. A lot of announcements were made by state defense companies, CETC in China, a Chinese radar manufacturer, they claim they have developed a quantum radar able to identify any flying or fast object, including stealth object that would kill some US systems. There was no scientific report on this. A lot of doubts. It seems it was more uh, an announcement than a reality. But in Beijing, there is a lab which has recently published a report on this. 
topic and also the capacity of quantum computation on the creation of new material that provides opens to new opportunities unknown of to have highly resistant materials, high heat environments, very important for in terms of ballistics, submarines, and uh, a lot of high potential outlets. And in the physics of weapons and simulation that could find output in the field of nuclear arms. Um, we have a question uh, for Christophe. Uh, Is it working? Yeah. What should be an ideal quantum policy for a state and its uh, government, which uh, would be uh, uh, technically adept and other than investment and in, uh, research? Yeah, so they're a good question. I think uh, precisely, I think it's pretty much in, uh, in tune with what I said. I think uh, uh, in a good uh, quantum policy, there should be money and resources dedicated for uh, ecosystems. Uh, all these activities that are a little bit uh, spread, spread out, but hard to fund, but governments tend to neglect also at the end of the day. Uh, so you might think about uh, making, putting a billion on quantum technologies and it all ends up being 99% for investment, for research. It's good for startups. So it's good for lab, uh, research labs, but all the additional value that's created for the 1%, I think, tends to be neglected. Uh, I think people and governments should really think seriously about that. There's training and formation as well. Uh, education, quantum education is important. We talked about China. Uh, that's also a topic there. I mean, lots of uh, interesting programs in universities. Most European and American universities now try to focus also, create uh, undergrad and grad programs on uh, quantum engineering and quantum technologies. But is it enough? Uh, not too clear to me. And uh, also, uh, let's say, quantum diplomacy, I'd say, uh, international collaboration. That's also something that's important uh, that should be put in, a, in a, my ideal quantum policy. But uh, above all, I think not to neglect all the activities of, that are to structure uh, the ecosystem. Uh, that really, at the end of the day, when you look at uh, what's left from a program, tend to be neglected, unfortunately, uh, but which uh, I think will be very important for countries to, to thrive and, and, be, uh, and create uh, yeah, a good program. Um, si y a pas question, moi je, je... If there's no other question, I, I use my, my privilege as a, as a facilitator to ask a few, uh, few questions. First, I'd like to come back to what uh, Alice was saying and what you said in your opening remarks. Who should we cooperate with today, especially when you want to create a, a system at European level? Who should we collaborate with also outside Europe? I think that's quite an important question. And also, we have seen a lot of things unfold recently in digital. So what are the mistakes we should avoid making again to avoid having a lot of uh, money put on the table, but at the end of the day, very few uh, tangible uh, advances uh, in terms, for example, of mm, the creation of major businesses, uh, which is more or less the situation that we are in today in digital. So I don't know, Alice, Christoph, or Julian, or, or Mark, if you'd like to uh, comment this, please go ahead. Well, maybe sur le, sur le deuxième point. Well, maybe about your second point about mistakes. I don't have a lot of experience, but I think that uh, we're fortunate uh, to be at the, the infancy of, of quantum. So I think now is the right time to try and think about how we should do, do things right. Now, um, I think that in Europe or in, in France, uh, we are thinking about creating national champions. Uh, uh, I suppose uh, that, that's very interesting, but it's a very much defensive stance. And now that uh, this technology is only at, at its start, I think we should think about uh, global operators, leading companies uh, uh, in these technologies that can be born in, in, in Germany or in France, but that could also set foot on, on the American or the Asian markets. I, I don't think we should be afraid of that at this point. Also, there will be consolidation going forward in, in, in the coming years. Some startups have been created. Some will be absorbed, uh, taken over by larger groups uh, uh, that have uh, capital. So I think this idea of a regional or national champion is a bit risky. Uh, we might end up lagging behind other continents if uh, uh, right from the start we, we don't go directly for the national, uh, regional, uh, international and global champions. 
And that's what we incite startups to do. We try to encourage them to, to very quickly address uh, markets uh, overseas, uh, uh, to work in development uh, in North America, for example, and that they shouldn't be afraid and, and, and overthink this because uh, I think it's very important. I think it's something that, that they can do, but you need to bear this in mind right from the start. And I think also it's feasible because uh, these technologies will require uh, time, uh, especially in, uh, in, in quantum uh, computing. Uh, these technologies will need time to be mature. So I think we can capitalize on that. Can I comment very, very quickly? It's just a question actually to pick up on that. Uh, do you think the American market, American businesses and American authorities would be willing uh, to open their markets to European outsiders? Well, I can I can answer about China, because I'd be so I'd be surprised if they did. But uh, well, I, I a molecule, for example, a Boston biotech that's seeking to create the best molecules and the best software for for drug design will go out there to to find the the best technology, whether it's French or. Uh, we have technologies that can develop uh, th these uh, technologies. There might be some uh, military markets, uh, you know, uh, cutting edge technologies where it might be a bit more sensitive. But, uh, you know, quantum so far is mainly c uh, for civ civilian applications. Uh, but markets are, are mainly, you know, non-military in the short term. Uh, conversely, there are American businesses that uh, uh, approach uh, uh, European uh, customers, Airbus, uh, BMW, Mercedes, that uh, use a lot of quantum computing today. So, you know, why wouldn't a, Europe, a French company go to America and sell to Ford or Exxon or its products, its technologies, even though these technologies emerged first in Europe? And I think it's been covered a little bit by what you both said, but what I think is very important is that it's a huge tech, right? From from the hardware to software, there's all this enabling technology, people that focus only the cables on the cryogenetics or uh, many other parts. And and we see that there are many different startups starting in, in some of these areas. So for example, in the Netherlands, there's QBlox or there's QOrange that, that focus only on the readout control or, or some other areas. And if we don't allow, uh, for example, to work with, with some of the giants like IBM, um, you know, they, these startups will have to work with the best in order to become become relevant in this market. So I don't think it's it's possible to exclude, uh, for example, uh, American uh, companies. We oui, um, thank you. I'm also going to contribute to this debate. I think it's a I think it's a real question, and that's why I sort of raise it even myself. Is that it's, it's, there's not necessarily a a good or right uh, and ready answer today. But I think what's true is that we're really seeing the emergence of a technology that is both civilian and uh, military. So if it's dual, it means, you know, th there will be different dynamics going on and there will be uh, probably a public commercial market and a market for military applications and it's probably not going to be necessarily all the same companies and maybe the requirements for which company you're procuring from won't be the same exactly if you're procuring, if you're a private company procuring a a quantum system for your own business or if you're a government procuring for national security purposes. But what we see learning from the sort of classical computing world and the existing uh, digital space is that uh, we do have indeed for like public procurement purposes, the US has a you know national preference rule that for example, the EU does not have or it has uh, you, you can have some added value if you're a European company, but that's not going to be a definitive requirement. And so that has tended to not favor necessarily European companies if they are, for example, slightly more expensive than, than, uh, than American providers. So that's, that's a political choice to make for, for companies. But what's certain is that I think for the, the military or the strategic dimensions of quantum, uh, quantum technologies, you know, uh, if it's like an uh, if it's like AI or all other emerging technologies, you you have to um, to take into account the uh, uh, alliance dimension or who you're dealing with, and so I think that's why uh, there is this interesting uh, and important debate going on uh, within the EU about uh, whether again, like whether or not to include the UK, considering that there is no political agreement. Uh, after Brexit, and you know, I think that's, that's it. Just shows that in, on certain aspects, it, it, it's no no random technology that we're dealing with. It's potential technology with a, with it's technology with potential um, uh, huge uh, you know impact, including strategic impact. And, and so, 
Uh, just a, uh, one final word, is it, collaboration is necessary for sure at the European level because, again, of the size of ecosystems and the need to you know, have uh, companies and, and th that can compete on the global scale. Um, but yeah, I think that's an open question. We got a question online, uh, which might be dedicated to uh, uh, Julian. Uh, what is your vision for the commercial timescale of KQD uh, in satellite communications? All right, thank you. So we already heard from Mark that there is, uh, there is quite uh, some advanced QQD uh, networks in, in China. I think it's uh, like 2,000 kilometers from Shanghai to, uh, to Beijing. Uh, there has been uh, uh, QQD satellites, I think it was already, what did you say, like 2017, 18, like quite some, 16 already, uh, quite some time ago. Um, and there will be many iterations within QQD, right? The, the, the key challenge with QQD is that even though it's, it's uh, on small length scales as possible today, there are so many limitations with, uh, with, with distance, with key uh, uh, length, with uh, rates, uh, with applicability. So I think it, it, even though there may be already be commercial applications today, it will be a very long process in which we gradually improve the, the infrastructure and more and more uh, um, uh, uh, actors will be onboarded onto this network. Um, but perhaps uh, defense uh, uh, actors will be uh, one of the first to, to benefit from this. And eventually over time, it will also be, uh, uh, for example, financial services that will, uh, will be onboarded onto a QQD network. We have a question in the room. Oui, une question. A question uh, following uh, Alice Pania's comment. I'm uh, a Danish citizen, and I used to take uh, part. Uh, was I was much involved uh, in uh, scientific cooperation between the Denmark and China. So my question is. Going forward, how can we organize uh, uh, relations between the EU and China, whether in fundamental research, but also in commercial areas? Thank you. Uh, alors, je, je, this is going to be the theme of uh, the next panel, and uh, one of our panelists uh, will be able to answer this much better than, than uh, me. Stephanie uh, Baum. Uh, cooperation with China at the moment uh, has ground to halt. The problem is that uh, scientific cooperation I I with China is a one-way street somehow. It's China that uh, chooses uh, the areas it wants to cooperate uh, in uh, with uh, the EU and its member states and not the other way around. Uh, France is very strong in fundamental physics so fundamental sciences particularly uh, physics and, and mathematics now, as regards the, the commercial dimension, I'm not sure I, I've understood your question, but I think this will be addressed uh, in the next uh, session uh, about uh, technology diplomacy. Right, uh, we're nearing the end of this uh, panel discussion. I just wanted to maybe come back to the geopolitical field. You've both mentioned tensions between China and the US, which will probably affect increasingly the quantum field. So I'd like to know, uh, some export bans have already been introduced by the United States against China. Um, do you think that the United States uh, is willing to slow down China's progression in this area? And what resources does it, does it have to do that? Well, at this point, I'm not aware uh, of any export barriers uh, in, in the United States uh, against China because we're really talking about um, a, a form of innovation that uh, is really in its infancy. Uh, there's no commercial uh, or industrial development, uh, so there's no economic uh, reason for the United States to introduce hurdles. For example, there are some uh, American sanctions against uh, Chinese companies uh, regarding uh, superconductors. So here, th there are some real uh, geopolitical, strategic, and economic reasons because this prevents some Chinese companies, especially Huawei, to upgrade their products. And uh, it also prevents them from uh, making some uh, 5G uh, uh, phones. So there's a direct impact, whereas in quantum uh, science, uh, 
you know, at this stage, it's much more happening in laboratories, and it's it's much more difficult to impose sanctions on exports. Maybe I, let me just add uh, a few words about uh, the the list of entities. So there are some entities uh, where you, you cannot export or re-export uh, uh, American technologies to to some de designated entities, and this list is growing. For example. Uh, uh, Chi the centers uh, with uh, Chinese super co supercomputers that can be hybrid and uh, can, can also be used for the development of specific technologies. I think that recently in April, uh, s Chinese supercomputing centers that are uh, involved uh, in the development of hypersonic weapons uh, were added to this list. So it's, it's not quantum science as such, but by uh, restricting exports or, or re uh, exports uh, to these entities, it can actually uh, affect the development of technologies, including quantum technologies. Uh, given uh, our past experience uh, in scientific cooperation with China and considering the scientific, the, the sensitive aspect of quantum technologies, do, don't you think that uh, we should take precautionary, additional precautionary measures in terms of IP protection and also as regards to the sharing of discoveries and, and also maybe additional safeguards. Yes, well, I, I think that's uh, a big issue today. Uh, we've particularly uh, waken up to this uh, during the pandemic. So there's a lot of thinking going on at the moment uh, about French cooperation in all uh, academic uh, uh, cooperation areas and also so, so with China. So cu the current question is how far should we go in scientific cooperation with China? Right. Well, uh, this is the end of uh, this first afternoon panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to the E3 for inviting me. And uh, I wish you uh, very, very interesting debates. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.